between the political core leadership, social stability, and the reform agenda. How does the three factors work together? Well, certainly you need to have the leadership in order to adopt policies on the one hand, promote economic growth, and on the other hand, provide jobs, improve income distribution, and so to achieve social stability. So I think that these three parts are integrated together. There is some degrees of capital control, as many have been observing here in China. I think the issue related to capital control was because the U.S., you know, is going to raise the interest rate further. And you know that after the 2008 global financial crisis, U.S. adopted quantitative easing, U.S. adopted, you know, low interest rate, and uh, causing a lot of short-term capital outflow to the developing country, including China. Now, in anticipation, the U.S. will have interest rate hike. Those kind of short-term capital uh, you know, started to revert back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I think that certainly will cause a large inflow and outflow of the short-term capital. And uh, for a developing country. But it's not just the U.S. It is going everywhere. And well, there has been capital control of capitals intended to go in anywhere. So that's true. And that was the reason why the IMF changed its policy towards capital account management. In the past, the IMF advocated capital account liberalization and advising a developing country to allow, you know, flow in, flow out of the short-term capital. And actually that was quite destabilizing for the maker economy in the developing world. And especially now, the high-income countries adopt the low interest rate, monetary easing, and so INF change its policy to advise the developing countries should have kept account management. And so to prevent the large inflow and large outflow, because those kind of large inflow and outflow will cause instability in the macroeconomy in the country. There has been argument coming from some of these developed economies who are enjoying, of course, capitals coming from developing countries, suggesting, well, if you guys are supporting globalization, you should also let capital globalized as well. Well, here that we need to distinguish two types of capital. One is capital for long-term investment in real sectors. And the other one is portfolio flow. It's a short-term capital flow. And those kind of money, in general, will not go to the real sectors. Mm -hmm. Will not to invest in production. In those real kind real. of capital will go to stock market, cause stock market bubble, will go to real estate mar market, causing the real estate bubble. Mm -hmm. Those kind of money is mainly for speculative purpose. And that will not contribute to the improvement of productivity or the income. So certainly, a developing country, they need capital in the real sectors. But the capital to go to those kind of speculative activity need to be very carefully managed. This is going to be short term or this is going to be long term. That's very important for the investors, both in and out. I think that uh, certainly it depends. <laughs> It depends on how responsible the advanced country will take a position on their monetary policies. And if they are not very responsible, then certainly the developing countries would have to have some kind of safeguard. But there seems to be a difference between the reform that we are specifically advocating these years compared to early years. That is, 
it is seem to be a top-down approach rather than from the very beginning a grassroots up approach. So many wondered how should we characterize China's approach these years? Even in the past, the reform always, you know, is a result of two measures. The first one certainly is some kind of policy initiatives took by the central government. And the other one is some kind of spontaneous, you know, effort taken by farmers, by entrepreneurs, local governments. And uh, for example, to, live, to have a reform and opening policy that was designed by Deng Xiaoping in the late 1970s, and that was top-down. Top down. Uh, certainly, we also had some kind of household responsibility system. Mm -hmm. We have a township and a village enterprises, and we also see local governments set up some kind of industrial park actively to invite foreign direct investment and so on. Mm -hmm. Those are local initiatives. And, uh, and that was the, you know, the spirit of reform in China. Certainly in the past, that we have many local initiatives and that unleash the people's you know, creativities. And China has been able to rely on these two combinations and achieve stability and dynamic economic growth. But with the deepening of the reform, some of the local initiatives, they move to different directions. And certainly, we also need to have a central coordination. And especially in some areas, which we call the hot bones. Give us an example for our international viewers particularly. For example, reform in the financial sectors. The reform in some kind of natural monopoly service sectors the reform in the state-owned enterprises. Those certainly will affect some kind of vested interest. And without central coordination, then it's very hard for asking people to reform themselves, especially they need to give up certain privileges. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we are really treading on a path that nobody else has ever done before? How are we going to double check our decisions, whether it is correct or wrong? How much space do we allow ourselves to make mistakes? Fundamentally, we know the purpose of reform is for the people and to increase people's you know, income, well-beings. You need to have higher productivities, and so you need to check where is the binding constraint for the improvement of your productivity or competitiveness? And keep that in mind and to be open-minded about you know, what are the issues and what are the opportunities. I think those kind of you know, pragmatic and with a strong desire to improve the efficiency for the improvement of well-being of people, that should be the guiding principles. So the question is, is there a China model? Or actually, China should follow the basic principles of the models of development? We should follow the successful models. <laughs> and uh, China is a successful country, so you can see a lot of features of Chinese economy or Chinese model are similar to that successful model. According to a report released by the Growth Commission in 2008 to study 13 successful economies, they find these 13 successful economies, they achieve 7% or more growth rate, continuous for 25 or more years. And they have several status facts. One, certainly they are open economy. Secondly, they achieve macro stability. The third one, they have high saving and uh, high investment. The first one, they are market economy or 
they move towards the market. Mm. The last one, they have proactive credible government. So you can see those successful economies, they rely on both market and the state.